Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's going to be part three of the Study or Be Deceived series. I'm hoping this will be the last one. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. We're going to do a little recap here. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven, past tense. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Keep that in mind next time you read Genesis 3, and, you know, when Eve is conversing with the serpent. Keep that in mind. You know, the... Church world, uh, you know, it's amazing the number of times I've seen Bibles and, uh, you know, pick Bibles with pictures in them. And right at, there at Genesis 3, they have a picture of a snake hanging from a tree with an apple and Eve's sitting there reaching for that apple. Uh, I don't think so. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this serpent, the devil and Satan, deceives the whole world. Uh, all of us are deceived to greater or lesser extent now let's face it people some of us study the bible to find out how much we are deceived and others just don't really care so you know there is a reason why the lord wants us to study his word. I mean, let's face it. The Bible is basically instructions for his sheep. Or you can listen to the devils. So let's take a look at a few things. You know, let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, and verse 10. So Jesus had just spoken a parable. And a lot of people say, well, you know, parables an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And the disciples came and said unto him, unto Jesus, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You know, why don't you talk to them plainly? Why, why do you tell them these stories, you know, these parables? What's up with that? Verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What? I, I was always taught that, you know, uh, Jesus spoke in parables to make it so people could easily understand. But Jesus says, nope, you're going to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, understanding is not given. Verse 12, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even and from him shall be taken away even that he hath. 
Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. For this people's heart is wax grossed, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Ah, okay. So, sounds to me like there's people that the Lord hides things from. Oh, yeah. All right, well, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I, you know, I read the Bible and it just don't make any sense to me. Well, is that the Bible's fault or is that your fault? Take a look at the book of James chapter 1. Now, James uh, grew up in a family with a father whose name was Joseph and had a mother's name was Mary. Guess what? This guy knew Jesus his whole entire life. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Well, isn't that funny? James says, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. You ever heard of uh, the lost tribes of Israel? Well, they're only lost to, to preachers. They're not lost to God. They weren't lost to James. And they certainly weren't lost to Jesus. No. They're only lost to modern-day demon nominational preachers. They don't know who Israel is. They don't know where they are. But I think uh, James knew. Verse 2. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Oh, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. I'm guilty of that as anybody, but what can I tell you? Verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right, here's the punchline. Number five. If any of you lack wisdom, all right, you want Bible understanding? You're lacking wisdom, right? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Huh, maybe we should ask God for wisdom, huh? You don't understand the Bible? Get on your hands and knees in the closet and pray and ask the Lord for understanding and wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't be double-minded. Don't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. I've heard it say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's a fence sitter. And, uh, you know, maybe they say God's on one side of the fence shaking it and Satan's on the other side of the fence shaking it. Which side are you going to fall on? Well, you know, 
I'll tell you what. I know one thing. I would never, never trust a TV preacher or a any church pastor to tell me the truth. Absolutely no way. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend my own time doing my own research. You know, you got a choice. You could either watch television or you could spend time studying the Word of God. So, why are there 666 different versions of the Bible? Because 665 of them are wrong. But there is one that's true. And I believe the King James is it. Why? Well, it's the most hated of all the Bibles. It's amazing. There are people, devils, that make a career out of bashing the King James Bible. After all, uh, what did the Lord do to Sodom? What did the Lord say to do to Sodomites? You wonder why uh, they hate the King James Bible? I wonder why. Modern Bibles don't do that oftentimes. Why God destroyed Sodom because they were just not very nice to strangers. Yeah. Yeah, they wanted to anally rape the, the angels that visited Lot. That's certainly not being very kind to strangers. You know, I always get... Uh, these lukewarm Christians by asking two questions. One, does God love everybody? And two, would God deceive anybody? And you know what? 90% of the people get it wrong. Does God love everybody? No, absolutely not. Do you think God loves Satan? God's going to throw... God is recorded as throwing the false prophet, the beast, and the devil into hell. Oh, of course, there's people that leave and argue, oh, well, hell doesn't exist. You know, it's just, you know, it's the grave. Yeah, listen to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll tell you that. Of course, they told you that uh, by 1976 that uh, Jesus would return. Well, wrong again. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted uh, the end of the world like four or five or six times already. So far, they've been wrong. They got a 100% track record. Of course, the, you know, they say, well, yeah, he, he came invisibly to, to rule in our hearts. Uh, yeah, of course, they don't believe the Bible. Oh, they believe uh, the Watchtower Society. Yeah. And they're one of the uh, easiest examples to get wrong. So, all right, let's take a look at Malachi 1. So, does God love everybody? Do you think God really loves Satan? Really? You think God loves people that are Satanists, Luciferians? I mean, really? I don't think so. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 3. God says, And I hated Esau. And then they'll tell you, Well, you know, that word hate really, really, really doesn't mean hate. It just means that he loved him a little bit less than Jacob. Really? Really? And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste, waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Is there a New Testament witness? Romans 9.13 As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You know, when people tell me that the word hated doesn't really mean hated, I'm going to have to go with the King James Bible translators. They were scholars. They were scholars. Okay. They weren't just run-of-the-mill heretics like you got today. 
Now, these people were scholars. These were like 50-something of the best Bible scholars in England at the time. They knew what they were doing. When people say, well, you know, Gentile, that's a mistranslation. Did you ever think that maybe the Lord used the word Gentile or had them use it to hide the truth from people? You know, like in parables? You know, maybe the Lord doesn't want everybody to know who the Gentiles were. Now, those of you that have listened to me for a long time, you, you know what I have to say about the Gentiles. Of course, modern day beliefs are, well, those are the non-Jews. Well, Judah was only one of 12 tribes. You know, you had 11 other tribes. And actually, the tribe of Joseph was uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. That makes 13 yeah. You think they're all Jews? No. Certainly not. When you look at the promises that God made to each one of the different tribes, and the Jews, modern-day Jews, uh, claim to be Jews, when they don't fulfill those promises that God made, you've got two choices. Either God lied, or those claiming to be Jews are not who they say they are. Take your pick. So does God love everybody? No. He hated Esau. And if you don't know why God hated Esau, I got a Bible study on it. I'd be more than happy to have you listen to it. And by the time you're done, you're going, wow, that's pretty heavy stuff, Bob. Well, no, not really. Not really. Uh, it's just, you know, I've read the Bible once or twice. But uh, I'll tell you what, Esau basically spit in God's face. Yeah, basically. And uh, Lord's going to return the favor one day. All right, so God hates Esau. And you want to know something? According to Josephus, a Jewish historian that, uh, and the time that lived around the time of Christ, recorded that King Herod, you know, the, the wonderful guy that killed all the babies in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. Yeah, that wonderful guy. I'm being extremely sarcastic here. Uh, Josephus wrote that King Herod was of Esau Edom. Yeah. You know, uh, I read that where King Herod had all the genealogical records that were kept in the temple destroyed. Some people say they were destroyed in the 70 AD destruction of of Jerusalem, the temple, by the Romans, I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, sometimes I think I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, but uh, it would make sense if King Herod was of Esau Edom. Wouldn't surprise me. Esau married a Hittite woman, which was of the tribes of the Canaanites. And if you don't know what happened in Genesis chapter 6, I got a playlist on that too. For how long? I don't know. YouTube can kick me off the air at any time. And uh, really, there isn't anywhere else to go. I've tried and tried and tried and tried. And... Uh, there's just really nowhere else to go that I know of. So, Lord either protects my channel, or if it gets deleted, well, then it's time to go. And oh, by the way, people, I've got uh, m almost, almost like 99% of my Bible studies you can download from, um, well, there's a link where you can download all my Bible studies 
and they're free of charge. You know, I don't copyright anything. And, uh, you know, it's to the glory of Christ. I uh, hopefully I'll uh, get a reward when uh, after this life is over. But we'll see. All right. So does God love everybody? No. What about would God deceive anybody? Oh, well, why does the Lord allow Satan to deceive the world? Why? Of course, that's Satan deceiving. But would the Lord himself deceive anybody? Well, let's go read Ezekiel chapter 14. Here you go, big dog. All right, Ezekiel was a what they called a major prophet. And if you listen to the History Channel, they'll tell you that Ezekiel chapter 1, when they're looking at the throne of God, really, it was UFOs and space angels or space aliens. Yeah, they were aliens, all right. They're fallen angels. But they want you to think a, a spaceship arrived Oh, yeah, a spaceship arrived and, and you know, they, they planted star seed on the earth. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, that's the kind of garbage you get from the uh, Porn Stars uh, channel. I mean, the Pawn Stars channel, you know, the history channel back when it used to actually be history. Yeah. Now it's Rick and, yeah, Pawn Stars. So, Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 1. So, here it is. Ezekiel, the prophet, is hanging out and let's read. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. Now, what's an idol? Well, you could have a, an idol of stone or ivory or gold or silver, or it could just be something in your heart that you place before God. Uh, some people, you know, money or, or sex or whatever, you know, it could be a lot of things. Son of man, these men have put up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. What's the stumbling block of their iniquity? Iniquity is wickedness and sin. So what's a stumbling block? Well, they're tripping on their sin. They have put their sin over and above the Lord. Somebody asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? He said to love the Lord. And the second was like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And on those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These people are putting their iniquity before the Lord. And that's what a stumbling block is. They're stumbling at the word. They're going to trip over their own sin and fall down. Son of man, these men have put up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, how dare these people come to me and want to ask me a question? You know, go ask your uh, other God a question. Don't ask me. Verse 4. Now, God's going to give them a warning here. Therefore, speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to to the multitude of his idols. 
that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. And there's another heresy running around. Uh, repent. What does repent mean? They'll say, oh, well, that means a change of mind, change of heart. Well, it does, but they'll tell you that repent means to just have faith. Have faith in what? I mean, loaning your neighbor $10 so because you have faith he'll pay you back at uh, next week when he gets paid? Have faith in what? Well, it does mean to have faith, but it also means to turn away from your wickedness. You know, turn around 180 degrees, you know, get off the broad path and get on the narrow path. Uh, but there's actually preachers, especially a famous one in Tempe, Arizona, that doesn't believe that repent means to turn away from sin. That's funny. John the Baptist taught it. Jesus taught it. Jesus taught his churches in Gen uh, Revelation 1 and verse and chapters 1 and 2. He told the believing churches to repent. So how can repenting just means to have faith? Uh, Jesus told the churches to the believing churches to repent of their unbelief? What? Yeah, they do. They teach this. Very famous preachers. Of course, I think they're tares, weeds, weeds in God's garden. Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. What does it mean to turn away from your abominations? If you're in wickedness, quit doing wickedness. I mean, come on. It's, it's not that hard to figure out. Verse 7. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Ooh, that don't sound good. And I will set my face against that man. And I will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Listen carefully. Here's the punchline. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. What? What? And if the prophet be deceived, when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Not the devil. The Lord. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him. Destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Wow. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him, that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. Oof. Oof. 
Uh, maybe we should keep reading this. I was going to stop here, but this is where we are today. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously. Uh, remember the Lord's prayer? He says, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. What happens when you trespass on a piece of land? It doesn't belong to you. You're in the wrong place, right? You're in the wrong place. That's what trespassing means. All right, let's uh, read verse 13 from the beginning here. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Uh, guess how that could happen? Well, no rain, right? Lord will stretch out his hand. Verse 14. So when the Lord is angry at the land for sinning, and we're not talking about ground, we're talking about the nation. God's going to send a famine upon it. Uh, when there's a famine, the Lord is angry. That's uh, basically your alarm clock in the morning giving you a wake-up call. Verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, Noah, it was said he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Daniel was called greatly beloved. And uh, let's see, Job uh, was called God's servant in Job 1. So, you know, these three men were beloved of the Lord. When the Lord sends uh, his righteous judgment upon a land, look out, because Noah, Daniel, and Job would be like the only ones left. Verse 15, if I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, are we talking about two-legged beasts or four-legged beasts? If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, these shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or, if I bring a sword upon that land, war, right? And say, sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but shall uh, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land, a plague, right? Disease. And pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut, a, to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth both sons and daughters, behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. 
and they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. That's right. All these things are going to be done with cause. All right, so the Lord will deceive people when they want to, when they want their wickedness more than they want the Lord. The Lord will deceive them. When you want the Lord more than anything else, ye shall find him. Trust me on that. Uh, is there a witness to that? Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. But if from thence... Thou shalt seek, seek the Lord thy God. Thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. For Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You look for the Lord, you'll find him. Now, let's take a look uh, let's go to Second Chronicles chapter eighteen. Now, this is a prophet of the Lord speaking. Again, he said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his, upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. Uh, what's a host of heaven? Well, they're talking about the angels. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel? that he may go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead. Now, who is Ahab? Ahab was the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat was king of Judah. See, your demonominational preacher will say, oh, well, Israel and Judah, they're the same thing. No, they're not. No, they're not. They had different capitals, different land area, different people, different kings. How can they be the same? They're not. Your preachers lie. But who was Ahab? Ahab was a terrible king. Horrible. Probably one of the worst kings in the history of the Bible. The Lord. Well, let's take a look at something. Oh, okay, who was Ahab? Well, let's read 1 Kings 16 and verse 33. And Ahab made a grove. Uh, guess what? Witches and Satanists love to worship in a grove of trees. Oh, they're worshiping Mother Earth. Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A. you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Huh. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Uh, I don't, it doesn't sound to me like the Lord likes Ahab very much. So let's go to 2 Chronicles, chapter 18, verse 18. The prophet says, again, he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead? What do you mean fall? Uh, didn't mean he stubbed his toe on a rock and he tripped down and fell. No, we're talking about falling down 
dead. And one spake saying after this manner and another saying after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit. A lying spirit. L-Y-I-N-G. We're not talking about a spirit laying on a bed. No. A lying spirit. A liar. A deceiver. Now this is not the devil's angels. This is the Lord's angels here. And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Whose prophets? Ahab's prophets. The false prophets of Ahab. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord, not the devil, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. Oh, boy. You know what? The Lord is going to let the world be deceived when they want their sin more than they want anything else in this world. Lord will give it to them. But, Chaplain Bob, I, uh, the Lord doesn't deceive people. You know what? You go argue with the Lord's prophets. You go argue with them. Don't argue with me, because I don't want to hear it. The Lord can and does deceive people for their wickedness. All right, let's take a look at something else here. All right, so Satan had war in heaven, and he was cast down to the earth. And like I mentioned in a previous Bible study, um, I suspect that the Lord made some kind of a deal. I had a call coming in. I lost my train of thought. But in Job chapter 1, Satan made a bet with God that if he... Uh, took everything that Job had, that he would, Job would curse God to his face. And the Lord said, okay, go ahead and try it. Uh, well, this is the Bob's paraphrase, but uh, you can't take his life. So, you know, Satan loves to uh, challenge God. He tried to have a war in heaven. Well, we're going to cover why the war in heaven and what the Bible says about that. But I suspect that uh, God gave Satan charge of the earth. I think Satan was uh, the covering cherub on the mercy seat, was represented by the covering angel of the, on the, the mercy seat. Now, I have a Bible study on that, too. Uh, until he decided he wanted to, uh, well... <laughs> Satan decided he wanted to be the head man, the boss, the top dog, the big cheese, the head honcho, the numero uno, the big kahuna. But uh, it didn't quite work out that way because that position has already been filled. So sorry. Um, but here we go. Let's go to uh, Ezekiel 28, chapter 1. Now, this is the deal. I think the Lord gave Satan a charge of the earth for probably a certain period of time, putting him in charge, and uh, Satan wanted the whole deal. I don't want just the earth. I want heaven too. Now, in my opinion, I believe the Lord feigned weakness, pretended to be weak. Uh, there was a guy named Sun Tzu. Perhaps you've heard of him, the art of war. He said that when you are weak, pretend to be strong. But when you're strong, 
pretend to be weak. You know, if you don't have the army to oppose your enemy, make your enemy think you're stronger than you are so that they don't attack. And then when you're stronger than, you know, than your enemy, make him appear, make yourself appear weak so that the enemy attacks you and you can destroy them. It's called deception. Sun Tzu, I mean, a lot of people, I read his book, oh, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago, approximately. Very interesting. The Art of War. Well, I suspect that the Lord pretended to be weak, and Satan thought, oh, I could take this guy. I could be the top dog here. I'm going to be the big kahuna, the numero uno. And uh, let's just say things didn't quite work out the way he had anticipated. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. Boy, we're doing a lot of stuff in Ezekiel. When's the last time you've ever heard a anybody preaching on Ezekiel? You know? Only time I've ever heard Ezekiel taught on television was uh, History Channel saying Ezekiel 1 was UFOs, space aliens. Yeah. No thanks. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. You ever known rich people? Oh yeah, their hearts are always lifted up. Uh, you know, I have never met a humble rich person in my life. Never. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying in my experience, I've never met one. But hey, that's just me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will... Therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit. What pit? Well, the grave, but also the pit of hell, right? And thou shalt die the deaths of them, that are slain in the midst of the seas. Yet wilt, uh, wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? You know, somebody's getting ready to kill you. Or what are you going to tell him? Oh, I'm God. But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, it saith the Lord God. Listen carefully. Here's the important part. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. What? How could a man have been in Eden, the garden of God? Ezekiel was 
you know, probably a couple thousand years after Eden. Well, we're going to answer that in a minute. Every precious stone was I covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship, workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. In the day that thou wast created, not born. Have you noticed that the precious stones were his covering? Uh, this roughly corresponds to the uh, breastplate that the Levi high priest would wear. Yeah. So, in the day that thou wast created, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. What's a cherub? An angel. Covereth what? Covered God's throne. My, I believe that's how you look at it. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You know, people will say, oh, well, this is just talking about a man. What? How can a man be upon the holy mountain of God? Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What man can walk around the stones of fire of the Lord, huh? Listen to this. Thou was perfect in the ways from the day that thou wast created, not born. So here it is. This one is perfect in his ways, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Who do you think this is talking about? Satan. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Yes, he, Satan was created good until one day iniquity was found in him. Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Uh, wouldn't a war in heaven be violent? Aren't wars violent? Yeah, they're not peaceful. They're not calm. They're violent. By the multitude of thy, of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Pride. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Let's stop right there, reels for a second. We're going to go right back. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 11 real quick. Verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Back to Ezekiel 28, verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire. I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. 
and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt be, uh, never shalt thou be any more. Wow. I believe that is, we're going to go to Revelation 20 and read about this. So keep that in mind. All right, let's go to Isaiah 14, verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. Now, Jacob was Esau's brother, and the Lord changed his name to Israel. Jacob means supplanter, trickster, basically. And he changed his name to Israel, which means prince of God, rules with God, you know, something along those lines. Israel. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in his own land. And the stranger, stranger shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Now I believe this is talking about the end times. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations." All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread unto thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now, in your modern Bibles, like the Jehovah Witness New World Order Translation and the NIV, and the complete Jewish Bible by Messianic so-called Jew David Stern, they replace that word Lucifer with morning star. And then when you read Revelation 22, uh, Yeshua, who they claim is Jesus, says he's the morning star. So now you got the case of who is the wandering star? Is the morning star Lucifer or is the morning star Yeshua, Jesus, who fell from heaven and is going down to be covered with worms in the pit of hell? Boy, I bet you those printers of those Bibles uh, had a real laugh. Which is why I hate the word Yeshua. Because of David Stern's Bible. If it wasn't for his Bible, I wouldn't probably hate the word Yeshua. But uh, when, when, when the complete Jewish Bible, a so-called Messianic Bible... 
replaces Jesus with Yeshua and says he's the morning star and then puts him in the place of Lucifer in Isaiah 14, going down to the pit of hell, I have a problem with that. I'm sorry, is Jesus Yeshua, the morning star, going down to the pit of hell? I don't think so. And then they'll say, well, you know, you, Lucifer is a uh, Latin word. It doesn't belong in the Bible because it's not English. Well, you know, beer is not an English word either. It's a German word. So maybe we should quit using the word beer. You know? Maybe you should quit saying taco. That's a Spanish word. So don't go to Taco Bell. You know, really. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in mine heart, for thou hast said in thine heart, I, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Positive confession there. I will do this. I will do that. But what does the Lord say? Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroy the cities thereof that hath opened that hath opened not the house of his prisoners you know if you don't know the story of the rich man and Lazarus Jesus went to Laz Abraham's bosom for three days to preach the gospel to those who that were in prison, Satan's prison house. And then he took them up to heaven. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction. Uh, besom is just a type of broom. And I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what you do with a mess? Dirt in a house? You sweep it up with a broom. The Lord has a broom of destruction. He's going to sweep up the filth of this earth. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. You know, Satan's whole purpose was 
He wanted worship. He wanted worship. Uh, I thought I was going to be able to finish this. But I was wrong. There is a huge lie being taught today. Where is the beast of Revelation going to be worshipped at? Well, it's going to be Jerusalem. You know, Satan wanted to be the top dog in heaven. He is cast out to the earth. Well, what is Jerusalem? It's called the city of David, the holy city. So what would be the ultimate blasphemy? Satan being worshipped as God in the holy city. But they'll try to tell you, oh no, the holy, you know, uh, the beast is going to, you know, it's Mystery Babylon, it's, it's Rome, it's Mecca, it's New York City, it's America. It's everywhere except where it's really going to be. And that is end time Jerusalem. That is where the, the devil wants to be worshipped. Let's face it, people. Satan wants worship. He wants to take people to hell with him, as many as he can. Let me tell you a quick little story of mine. I was doing volunteer work in a hospital, and the uh, nurse in charge basically said, oh, I want you to go look after this person. She said, he's an AIDS patient. He was in bad, a bad, bad way. Probably a sodomite. I don't know. But uh, if I remember correctly, he had the purple splotch splotches on his skin. Well, that was, that's an end time. You know, when you get the purple splotches on your skin, you're it's almost over for you. All right. So she told me that he had a habit of light, uh, spitting on people. You know, hey, I'm going to die of AIDS. I'm going to give it to you, spitting on you. You're going to get it too and die. I'm not going to die alone. I'm going to take some of you with me. That's basically their mentality. So the nurse told me he likes to spit on people. You know, they thought, well, you know, AIDS is a virus and, you know, spitting can transmit it, whatever. Well, what was the first thing I told him when I entered the room? I told him, oh, yeah, I'm Bob. You know, I'm here to look after you today. But I hear you like to spit. And I told him flat out, I says, you know what? If you spit on me, I promise you, if you're lucky, I will only break your nose. I will beat the living crap out of you. After all, this is not a job. I'm a volunteer here. You know? And I might go to jail for assault, but uh, you know what? You're going to have a broken nose at the very least. Guess what? He didn't spit on me. Yeah. He did not spit on me. And I told, I meant it too. I would have beat the living crud out of him. And I'm not a big, strong guy, but, you know, he's bedridden. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, Satan knows where he's going to go. So, and he hates us. He hates God the Father. He hates God the Son. He hates the Holy Spirit. And he hates us because we are made in God's image. Why? Because he tried to be the top dog. The numero uno. The big kahuna. The big cheese. Didn't work. Didn't work. So if he's going to be thrown to hell, he's going to try to take as many of us with him because he knows that it pains the Lord to see his children to follow the, the devil. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come 
to repentance. Yeah, people, the devil wants to take as many of us with him as possible because he wants to cause as much pain and sorrow to the Lord as he can. At least that's the Bob theory. I could be wrong. Maybe he has other reasons, but, you know, that would be my guess. And if you got another guess, well, your guess is as good as mine. All right, so this is part three. I guess there's going to be a part four because I got to close this out and it's already been an hour. So, uh, yeah. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Father, God the Father, and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.